Over 170 years ago, Henry David Thoreau observed, the mass of men lead lives of quiet desperation. Is this you? Do you feel trapped in the rat race we call life? Are you truly the person you desire to be? Are you unhappy with where you find yourself, physically, mentally, or spiritually? Let's make the life changes necessary to empower you with happiness and contentment, belief and confidence in yourself. Join the discussion with countless other people who want nothing more than to be the best version of themselves that they can be. Welcome to Better with Jimmy Blackman. Hey folks, I'm Jimmy Blackman, your host. Welcome to Better. And uh, today, you know, all of these are special to me, quite frankly, or I wouldn't have these folks on the show, <laughs> but today's unique. Uh, I've got uh, a soldier who served with me in 7th Squadron, 17th Cavalry Regiment uh, back uh, 2008 to 10, uh, but covered the year in which uh, I wrote the book uh, Pale Horse, um, our 2009 deployment to um, the N2KL region of Afghanistan on the AFPAC border. This is the area where the attacks of 9-11 were planned and rehearsed. It was the bloodiest piece of terrain uh, on the planet at the time, and that year we'd go down in history, uh, we would be a part of some of the, the biggest battles, the ones that all of you uh, see movies about, quite frankly, uh, today. Uh, those were our battles. And one of uh, the soldiers who was a door gunner on uh, one of the Chinooks uh, for us was uh, uh, Juan Carlos Hernandez. And uh, Juan is here with me today. Juan, thanks for coming in today. It's good to see you. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me and in having me uh, come on and share a little bit about my story and who well, I am. It's my, it's my honor, uh, frankly. I uh, We'll talk a little bit more in depth about it in a minute, but of course, um, I, I sent that mission out and uh, Juan lost his leg uh, on the mission. The aircraft was shot down. Uh, to give some background, uh, I guess, to the kind of the context there, many of you may have uh, seen, again, the, the Battle of Keating, uh, the, the movie Outpost, things like that. But of course, that was our battle at Keating. And then um, there was another uh, outpost in the Camdash Valley called Lowell. And it was the only one left when Keating, of course, was burned to the ground. And we had to evacuate it to get out of that valley. And uh, that valley is just unbelievable. There's one way in and one way out. The, the ridges on both sides are just massive. And um, uh, we did the, the calculations of what it would take to get everything out of there, all the soldiers and equipment, and it would be 12 turns of a Chinook per night. One turn would be go in, pick up sling loads, bring them out. That's one turn. 12 per night with one way in and one way out. So you can imagine you canalize yourself. The enemy knows you're in and out. And frankly, the way we would determine how many turns we would do was me and, uh, and, an, and an interpreter listening to the enemy's radios and trying to determine when enough was enough. And uh, on this night in the fall of 2009, um, we had planned for 12 turns. And on turn number six, uh, Juan was a door gunner on the left side of the Chinook uh, going into uh, Cop Lowell and on short final, uh, the aircraft was shot with an RPG and um, and, I, and I'll let him go into uh, to more of the detail of what he experienced there, but the aircraft was shot down and ultimately um, Juan lost his leg. We had to evacuate him out and uh, today we're going to talk about briefly about the event, but more more in depth about his recovery and the life that he's made um, since then and his success and in, in living and in, in just just the best version you can imagine of uh, of a great life out in California. I do want to preface this and, and then I'll be quiet and let him uh, talk a bit here. Um, so one, the way he came to the United States and joined the army, because this was a story that I thought was just amazing. And that is, um, his mom uh, made a run for it. She put uh, Juan on her hip when he was just a baby. She crossed uh, the, the the border between Mexico and the United States with her baby to seek a better life for her child. And she made it in the United States, made it into California, uh, ultimately 
Um, that's where Juan grew up. And at 17 years old, uh, Juan joined the Army. He enlisted in the Army. Uh, he came to us at uh, Fort Campbell, Kentucky, the 101st Airborne Division, and uh, serving in the United States Army now without citizenship, um, goes to combat with us. He volunteered, by the way. We had a competition for door gunners. I remember this. A lot uh, Guys wanted to be door gunners. And uh, Juan was uh, one of uh, a select few that we we handpicked to be our door gunners on our Chinooks. And um, and then in May, I think it was May, I'm, I'm drawing on memories that were uh, 2009, but in May, uh, we flew you up to Bagram where you were sworn in as a United States citizen in Afghanistan. Is that right? That, that is yep. correct, yes. That's awesome. So across the border, raised, born, you know, in California, 17 years old, enlists in the United States Army, goes to combat, applies for his citizenship, gets it in May of 2009, and uh, and that fall loses his leg. And, um, and now uh, just last week, uh, uh, finished his degree program and is working uh, with the VA. And I'll let him talk a little bit about that. So let's go back to that night. Tell me kind of, uh, it, it was, uh, we knew how dangerous it was. Everyone did. And I know you felt it. Talk us through kind of how that mission went from your perspective, Juan. Yeah. Oh my God. Wow. So, I mean, yeah, we, we had been in country already for 10 months. Um, so you know, we had seen a lot, especially with our first helicopter being shot down in January, um, only uh, a month after arriving in country. So we we all knew it was just a matter of uh, when, not if. And yeah, I mean, after flying over three, close to 400 hours since being there to us, it was just kind of like, all right, we're going to go in there, do our mission, do what we need to do. Um, do our rotations and, you know, go back to base and, and do it again ne the next day. That was our mindset, right? Um, so, yeah, like you said, uh, our sixth turn um, and coming in, to me, everything looked normal. Looking out of the nine visual goggles, everything looked as it usually does. And then on our approach to the LZ, um, just out of nowhere, saw out of my goggles, a bright flash, and then followed by a loud bang. And everything went black. Um, you know, I found myself laying on the floor of the helicopter in the companion way that leads to the cockpit um, where the pilots are. And I scrambled for my MVGs, trying to find them. Thankfully, they were still around my neck. And I held them, put them back on my helmet, and I started looking around, looking inside the helicopter, seeing if there was something, fires going on. Thankfully not. Um, I made several attempts at getting up. I couldn't. Um, at that point, everything was numb um, from my chest down. I could still move my arms. So I, I tried picking myself up again, just trying to grab onto whatever I could and lifting myself. And I just couldn't. Um, you know, at that time, I was pretty fit, pretty strong, um, you know, spend all year loading and unloading equipment of the helicopter. So I, you know, I was 180 pounds. So I'm like, man, I can't pick myself up. <laughs> Something must be seriously wrong. Um, I tried communicating with the rest of the uh, the team over uh, the comms, but nothing, everything was just silent. All I could hear was the, the engines of the Chinook just revving up and down, up and down. And feeling the helicopter swaying left to right, left to right, and eventually um, what felt like stabilizing. Um, I think uh, the pilots, uh, Maggio and Young, were able to somehow figure out that, okay, we both have to work together and control this without talking to each other, and we're able to bring the helicopter to the LZ um, as smoothly as possible, right? Um, I was still on the ground. I, I still couldn't feel anything and as soon as we landed um <laughs> this body comes jumping over me and that was uh warrant officer uh, maggio taking off to let the uh you know the people on the ground know what happened because they couldn't communicate um and then uh sergeant rival um the crew chief was 
standing near me and he was looking at me. And so I started tapping his leg and pointing at my leg, um, just telling him that that's where the most of the pain was. And as soon as he, he noticed, um, uh, I already had my tourniquet in my hand. I was going to say, you told me when we talked back in like 2014, you were, you were telling him, get the tourniquet on me. Yeah. So I, I somehow I, you know, it just kicked in survival instinct. I, I had my tourniquet on my chest, on my body armor. I took it out. I handed it to him and boom, he started applying it, put it right below the knee. Um, and within a matter of seconds, I mean, it was fast. Um, other soldiers from the that were on the ground started running on the helicopter. You know, within a matter of minutes, my pants were completely torn off. Um, I had an IV going. I had morphine going. Um, you know, putting me on the um, the gurney, carrying me off the helicopter, and taking me into a what was like a makeshift, um, I guess. Uh, medical uh, room where they literally stripped me down and started checking my body for injuries and just kept working on me, kept me awake. Um, I remember just being super tired, super sleepy, super thirsty. I kept asking for water and they're like, no, no, we can't give you any water. I remember one of the medics just got a cotton ball, soaked it in water, put it in my mouth. And that was like, the best feeling ever. Um, <laughs> meanwhile, I could hear everything that was going on on the outside. I could hear the Apache's helicopter flying around, shooting their guns, shooting at the mountains, and also the guys on the ground, and just all the commotion, you know, what was happening. And yeah, I remember uh, Young, Warren Officer Young, came over and uh, talked to me for a little bit, you know, shook my hand, patted me on the shoulder, and then left. And gosh, I, you know, it could have been maybe 10 minutes that I was right. there for, but it felt, like it felt like an hour, honestly. Uh, for Are the you thinking that you may be paralyzed at this point? Yeah, I couldn't feel anything. I mean, like, honestly, like, could have been the morphine, could have been that yeah. I was going into shock, but I just felt like my whole body was numb. I was cold. Um, you know, I, I couldn't see what they were doing. Um, basically, they... One of the guys was leaning in front of me and the other medic was working on my lower body. So I was like, I, I don't know. I, I couldn't see anything. Um, right. So they just kept me calm. They kept talking to me, asking me questions, where I'm from, sports, what I like to do, and basically just keeping me alert and awake. And eventually the, the medevac came in. They got me on the bird, uh, strapped me down. And then uh, we landed in, I think it was Bostick. And yeah, yeah. that's where uh, they put me out. Um, that's yeah, where we had I, a surgeon there. Yeah. So that's where I was completely knocked out. And I woke up, I guess, the next day. <laughs> and, uh, I was in Bagram. Um, yeah. That's when I, I woke up and then uh, still groggy, uh, pretty drowsy, but I could look down on my legs and I could see, you know, I could only see one of my, my feet sticking up and the other, I couldn't see the other foot. Right. So I was like, okay, you know, but I could move my left leg at that, at that point. So it's like, all right, you know, what happened, happened. Um, I'm alive. I'm here. Um, they're going to take care of me. I'm going to be okay. Um, and you know, it was really great was seeing familiar faces. Um, huh. You know, people from from varsity, uh, seventh yeah. back, who were there in Bagram, started coming in, talking to me, saying hi, just just keeping me company. Um, other friends who were um, part of 159th, who I met back in Fort Campbell, who were there, they come by and say hi and talk to me, and just just you know keeping keeping me in their thoughts, letting me know that they're there, and that was really helpful. Um, that's, that's when I learned that, that community, it's really important. And I think that's where I started that, that attitude too, of like, you know what, this is going to be okay. I'm going to be all right. There's a lot of people who support me. Um, everything's going to be okay. I'm going home and I am going to recover and I'm going to be all right. So I want to say I was in Bagram for maybe two days and then flew over to 
Germany, then Walter Reed, and then down to San Antonio, uh, Brook Army Medical Center. Right. Um, yeah. And it's, you know, for the listener out there that, um, you know, you have an event like this where this aircraft gets shot down uh, with an RPG. Um, believe it or not, <laughs> if, you know, you can read the whole story in Pale Horse, but uh, we flew that bird out that night. It was a long time, but we we had to get it out before daylight because we knew the enemy would swarm that outpost and, and get it on Al Jazeera, record it and everything else. So it was a a Herculean act, you know, act by a bunch of folks to to get it out, but we got the bird out. And the next night we had to go right back in. We had to finish because we had taken essentially well five loads out that night, and um, and now we were committed. And so you can just imagine, you know, the next cruise in. I mean, this happened that night, traumatic event, and the next day you've got to go back in. And so, uh, you know. Combat can be um, a painful, painful experience and a real wake up. And, you know, you you knew it was necessary. It just had to be done. And so we kept going. In the meanwhile, uh, we're getting reports uh, from you. There's folks staying in contact. And uh, and I mentioned to you this before, but one of the, the people would come by and, and tell me, you know, hey, we, we you know, this is what's going on. We heard and update me and everything. And one of the, the first reports I got, I don't I don't know if you'd made it to Walter Reed yet, maybe, but it was, hey, I'm going to snow ski by Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> Where yeah. did that come from? <laughs> Yeah, no, I, I think by that point, I, I was already in uh, San Antonio. In San Antonio? At, okay. uh, yeah, Brook Army Medical Center. Um, so I I don't know if you're aware, but they have a, this place called the Center for the Intrepid, uh, an amazing yeah. facility um, that's right there within like five minutes from, from the hospital. And that's where I did my rehab. And within a matter of days that I was at the hospital, um, you know, I had a friend... <laughs> crazy small world um a friend that i went to high school with she was doing a internship at that facility as a uh, recreational therapist and she came and visited me with the recreational therapist at the center for the intrepid and i was like oh my god what are you doing here and she was like oh i'm i'm an intern here and i was like oh wow what a small world um, but, you know, we got to talking and she informed me of what they do, uh, recreational therapists. Um, at this point, I had no idea what a recreational therapist was. And so what they do is they take out, they would take out the, uh, you know, the wounded soldiers out in events like, uh, you know, going paintball, going skiing, going uh, kayak fishing, doing wheelchair basketball, doing all these kind of adaptive events, right? So while they're doing the rehab and they were like... <laughs> You know, we have a skiing event coming up in December, and this was still in October. And they're like, "Yeah, you think you you be up and you know down to go?" And I'm like, "Well, I you know I, I guess that that sounds like something I could challenge myself to get to, um, whether I'm walking or not." And she was like, "Oh yeah, no, they have these adaptive uh, mono skis. I think that's what they're called, where you sit in and somebody's behind you guiding you." And I was like, "Sure, what the hell? Why not? Let's do it." Um, so that was my goal, um, to get healthy enough to where I could go on an event like that. Um, and honestly, that's how I, I saw my, my recovery. Um, I would make goals for myself. You know, I'm gonna, in three months, I'm gonna do this in six months, I'm gonna do this and then on and on and on. And so it gave me something to look forward to. Um, it kept me striving and moving forward and always challenging myself and not being so, stuck in one place right and not being stuck in my mind so I was always looking at new things to do looking at new things to be engaged in and uh, participating with others uh, with the other veteran uh, not veterans but it's still active um, during the rehab there uh, so yeah that's that's true I did tell people that you know by December I should be uh, skiing um, <laughs> whether it's on one leg or in a prosthetic or in a uh, bucket with uh with a single uh blade skiing down the mountain. So. So, so that was your mindset this very positive mindset you were goal oriented D did you ever have any real bumps in the road or were you able to stay positive the whole time i mean you know as an amputee yeah i i had several bumps on the road um uh, especially in the beginning when when i i would 
start getting used to my leg and then I would have some kind of skin breakdown, um, you know, irritation or my leg wasn't fitting properly. So I would have to stay out of the leg for a couple of weeks. Then I would get back on the crutches. So, you know, you, you, you find yourself finally starting to find some kind of routine and cadence and everything you're doing. And then you get your leg taken away because, you know, you, the doctor doesn't want to risk it that you continue wearing it. And maybe there's some kind of infection um, because that happens often, right? Uh, somebody gets an infection and they have to, and if it doesn't heal, they have to um, have a revision and then even amputate even higher. Right. Um, and so I heard some stories about that happening to some individuals where they ended up losing their knee because, you know, they got they had a irritation, an open wound, and then they just kept wearing their prosthetic and then the sweat and an infection and then just led to other issues. Um, so yeah, those were some of like the roadblocks. Um, but it also was a little bit of like the, the mental too. And, you know, I was really lucky. I was fortunate because at the Center for the Intrepid, I think twice a week, we would have a group therapy session um, and they would provide lunch. And, and it was uh, it was hosted by uh, Wounded Warrior Project. So they would provide lunch. And then there was a psychologist that worked there, um, also a former service member. And we would all meet together, usually anywhere from five to 10, sometimes 15 guys and some girls as well. And we would just talk for 30 minutes to an hour. Um, you know, he he would facilitate, he would start the, the conversation and then we would just start talking to each other, talking to the entire group. Um, some of the older veterans who had been there a little bit longer and were also older in age um, would share a lot of things that have worked for them, um, especially to us younger ones. I mean, I was 22, so I was still trying to find myself, who, who am I? And now I have this amputation. Um, so I have to like, think about who I am going to be now. Right. So it, that was really helpful. Um, having that kind of support and access to, to that kind of group therapy, in my opinion, really helped me a lot. Um, and it would be really interesting to see, um, uh, some kind of study done on those of us who had that kind of group therapy during that time versus those who didn't, um, just to see like how and who did who came out of it um, with a different kind of outlook. Um, so that was really good. And also just having friends in the area that that was really helpful just to to have that kind of support. And you know, like I said, I've just kept busy. Um, I got introduced to cycling uh, before I even started walking. There's a local nonprofit in San Antonio that would do cycling outing events. Um, and then I got introduced to a hand cycle. Um, and that's how I started. But then once I got a prosthetic, I decided to get on a upright bike. And from then I just kind of took off. Um, I started doing events with another organization throughout the country, uh, five to six events, week-long events, um, you know, just to kind of challenge myself right and show so, that so this is a good happen. point this is a good point to show some spit some pictures i'm going to share my screen here um let's see of course this is uh for some reason gonna go really slow for me uh, uh sharing are you seeing my screen or no uh now i am yep yep got it all right so i think that's breck epic isn't it uh no no this is a, a race down here in southern california uh this is oh yeah i remember this picture this is from uh 12 hours at temecula so i i, I used to do they don't do them anymore but uh you know race for 12 hours right okay. so the course that was like eight or nine miles long and just do as many laps as you can do for 12 hours. Um, but yeah, this was, I don't remember when this was, this was like 2014, 15, I think. Right. Uh, but yeah, that's. Look at that young guy. 
Yeah, I think this was in 2014 as well, down in uh, an adaptive cycling camp with the uh, um, United States Military Endurance Sports, uh, USMES. Yeah. Uh, well, they they had a like a week long uh, adaptive cycling camp down there, and uh, a group of us went down there, and they kind of taught us some racing skills and tactics, and um, it was super fun. Yeah, it was great. I mean, it was a good time and really challenging. Um, well, yeah, the next one doesn't look as challenging, but you're going to have to explain it. Oh, <laughs> so this is an event called the Belgian Waffle Ride. Yeah, I'm uh, very familiar. <laughs> Go <yeah>. ahead. <laughs> oh, man, I think I think this was my very first one. I've done it like five or six times, but it's a hundred and anywhere from 130 to 140 miles, right? Each year changes. Um, yeah, like 10,000 feet, 12,000 feet of climbing. And this is like towards the last, 30 miles or 50 miles this usually they have this place called the oasis and they have people serving alcohol all kinds of food bacon and just kind of like encouraging people to finish and complete the event as as fast as possible uh, but yeah i mean it's i'm not that fit anymore um <laughs> uh you but you've done so much and i want to i, I want to hit a couple you have done the breck epic though I have, yeah. Which is a week long and a technical road race. So, you know, to be an amputee and and be able to to do that, I mean, that that is not an easy course for just the average healthy mountain biker. But yeah. of course, I did Leadville last year and I was all proud of myself. How many times have you done the Leadville 100? Uh, four times. Four times. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Yes. Yeah. So what's the hardest event you've done? Ooh. Oh my God. I tell you what, I mean, so there's a, a race down in Costa Rica called La Ruta de los Conquistadores. And that's a three day race. However, the first day, it's like doing Leadville back to back. It's just so miserable. The first day, it, it, it's like 50 miles and about 10, 11,000 feet of climbing. You're just going through the jungle and you're literally hiking your bike through sections that are just nothing but mud. Um, so it's a mountain bike race. Yeah, it's a mountain bike race. Um, so it's three days. And the first day is kind of like the day where you either are going to make it or you're not. Um, a lot of people don't make the time cut. Um, which is 12 hours, I believe. And I made it in about 11 hours and like 50 minutes. So I barely made it. And I, that was in 2013. And I was coming off of my, my first sub nine uh, time at Leadville. And I was, in, I was in shape. I was fit. Yeah, sub nine at Leadville is no joke. <laughs> and it took me that long just to do 50 miles. <laughs> it, was the mud. it was the mud. It was just like, it's miserable. And it's humid. Um, it's just really, really challenging. And, and as an amputee, I mean, I, I got stuck in mud. My my prosthetic got stuck in the mud several times. I had to take it off just so I could like muscle it out of it. And um, yeah, it was challenging. That That's probably the hardest, the hardest race I've done. But, you know, the, the second and third day were way more chill. Um, yeah. You know, still, still a lot of climbing, but nothing like the first day. That, right. that has to be the one of the worst events um, I've ever gone to. In fact, it's <laughs> it so hard and challenging that I, I got invited by um, a friend that I met down there who helped sponsor the race and they were gonna count me the entry, uh, which was like almost two grand. I would just have to fly myself down there. And I was like, nah, thanks, that's all right. Thank you, but no thanks. Yeah, I'm like that's too much suffering. I don't want to put myself through that again. That was that was a hard day. Wow. So um, I guess I should share one more because um, is that mom? Yes, that's my mom. All right. So that's that's the lady that made it all possible, right there. Yeah. Yeah. So this was uh, just a couple of weeks ago, a few weeks ago. Um, yeah. Tell us about this. So that was my official graduation from Loma Linda University. Um, but my, my program ended in December 
I, I passed my boards in February. And after that, I, I got hired by the VA um, as an occupational therapist. Um, so I, I have been working already for, for a few weeks um, when that picture was taken uh, just recently. So, but yeah, I, you know, um, what's even crazy is even more crazy is that I started my program in June of 2020, uh, right at the start of the pandemic. So it was really difficult, um, you know, being that our program is very hands-on, um, a lot of clinic time, and especially with anatomy, with uh, dissecting and learning the body and the muscles, nerves, it was really difficult because we didn't have that time. We didn't have that opportunity that previous classes I had uh, prior to mine. So we were spending maybe two hours max in the lab um, studying and seeing how everything works with the body, the anatomy of it. And then the rest of five, six hours, just recorded lectures. Um, so it was pretty crazy. Uh, we weren't, we weren't given that same type, type of, um, I guess, hands-on learning that many of the other students receive, yeah. but, you know, we still got a great learning experience, um, throughout the duration of the program. Um, but yeah, it's 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 just fascinating. I I I started <laughs> I started from like zero college credits in 2015. I I actually started <laughs> taking some remedial math and English courses because I didn't do so well in the the placement exam for uh, my community college. So that first and second semester were just nothing but like elementary algebra, like high school English. So it took me some time to kind of actually start taking college level courses. Um, so seven years later, you know, I'm graduating with the master's in occupational therapy and honestly all paid for by um, my time in the service um, because I, I don't well think deserved. I would yeah, I don't small believe. price to pay by the American taxpayer for the things that you did, Juan. And uh, exactly. you know, it's um, it's it does a soul good to to get to reconnect, like you said. Those, you know, some of the things that I found that I miss the most is the camaraderie, the brotherhood, the you know, the trust, and it, it's it's just not the same in the business world. Not that there aren't good people out there, but the environment, the that we were in really created bonds that are unparalleled. I think anywhere that you can experience. And um, uh, it's, it, it always just makes me feel good to be able to, to connect with folks like you and especially to see, to see your success and you're an inspiration uh, to folks. And I really hope that, that, you know, just by listening to your story, those that, you know, are feeling down, whatever it may be, and it's, you know, whatever it is, it's significant to the person going through it, experiencing it, that they can see the power of a positive outlook, of setting goals, of making a choice, because you had a choice, you, you know, you, you could have been, look what's happened to me, I'm a victim, and, you know, the, my life has changed at 22 years old, but you didn't. You, you chose to, man, the experiences you've had are just incredible. And, um, and now you get an opportunity to give back to other veterans. So I, I hope you find that incredibly rewarding as well. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, that was one of my visions, right. To, to, to eventually graduate and get a job working, helping veterans. So to see it now at full, this play, it's, it's really rewarding uh, to me to be able to serve, you know, continue serving and mm -hmm. serving those who have also served. So just trying to provide them with uh, the best care that they deserve and treat them with the respect that, you know, they all deserve. So that's, that's my number one goal, right? I, I may not be the best clinician, but I will do my best to be the best human being and treat them all with the most respect that they all deserve. That's all somebody can ask for, Juan. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me. It's great to see you. And uh, I love following your journey on social media. Now that you're out of school, I expect some monster rides to keep an old man going. <laughs> <laughs> That's the plan. That's the plan. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Thanks for your time. We'll talk to you later. Okay. Sounds good. Thanks. Passes by, another one's gone To the other
the sand. 